Much like we could ask that uh, you know, age-old riddle, which came first, the chicken or the egg? We could ask the same type of question or riddle about the media, which came first, the culture or the media? Does culture influence media or does media influence and drive culture? And the answer to both of those things really is yes, I think. You know, uh, to all of that, it's really almost as unanswerable as the chicken and the egg question. So, um, but regardless, it doesn't excuse us from being aware culturally of what's happening in the media and the impact that culture has on media and vice versa. So, uh, in this video, we will examine the critical media perspective of cultural analysis in our continuing examination of critical media studies. So, Let's start, as we always do, by taking a look at what is cultural analysis. Well, cultural analysis examines artifacts from a perspective that seeks to understand how media influence the way we think about the world as political and social beings. So, um, essentially, how does media use and impact culture? And, and almost kind of vice versa, because they are really very interconnected. That's that's cultural analysis, and that's the framework that we're going to use and and uh, and take a look at in this video. So the major premises of cultural analysis are pretty straightforward. First, that cultures and ideologies normalize and privilege certain perspectives, as we talked about when in our previous video. We talked about culture and ideology and laid that foundation. One of the things we talked about. Or a couple of things we talked about were how ideologies normalize things and they enhance privilege, right? They, they, we use uh, uh, ideologies to structure our society and our culture through things like privilege. So cultures and ideologies normalize and privilege certain perspectives. When you have them, they are seen as normal and they are uh, given the advantage over uh, ideologies and cultures that don't have those perspectives, right? Uh, media is frequently used to reinforce and exclude then other uh, cultures and ideologies. So we use that. We, we see that these cultures and ideologies are what are quote unquote normal and it's and preferred. And those perspectives are what we want. So media then is you is frequently used to to reinforce that and to 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 more broadly um, express that this is normal. This is what is desirable. This is what we should want. Uh, and this is the cultural and ideological norm. And uh, and so and we do that to, to reinforce some of those things. And then, of course, through the exclusion of other things, say that these are not normal and these are or, or by no, negative portrayal, say that these are are not normal things are not desirable things for our culture. Okay. So cultures and ideologies normalize and privilege these perspectives. And then we use media to reinforce or exclude those other cultures and ideologies. Uh, it's also social the, the socially powerful or privileged groups typically create and or control the media. So uh, media is used to reinforce these things. And it's also usually controlled by those socially powerful things to indicate and to and then reinforce that that those are desirable things, that what they have and what they want are desirable. So, you know, it kind of creates this cycle. We see that we have this dominant culture group and then they are the ones who then create the media. Okay. They dominate the culture and they dominate the media. So they create the media and then these cultural norms are established through those media outlets as, you know, this is what's desirable. This is what's good. And then society adjusts and seeks to normalize based on what they're being told is normal, what they're being told is desirable and good, which then feeds into the dominant culture group. Okay. And reinforces that particular group. Um, so it creates this cycle of uh, and, and helps people maintain that power in that situation. So as an example, let's take a look at the 90s. Let's take a look at the 90s just in general and the media, the 90s and and how that reinforced some of these things. So in the 90s, the dominant culture group, as we kind of touched on in, the, in a previous video, were heterosexual white males. Right. That's been the dominant power group and dominant culture group for a long time. So by and large straight white men are making media decisions and 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 establishing that culture so they are the ones creating the media for the most part so and we see that reflected in the media the most popular show in the 90s or shows 
In the 90s, we could see ER, for example. It's very, very popular, very, very white, um, very, very heterosexual, and uh, and largely male-dominated. Uh, Seinfeld, same type of thing, right? We had um, three straight white guys and and one woman there, but uh, all all of whom are white and uh, uh, all of whom are are heterosexual. Um, friends, you know that it's been much discussed when you look at media about just how white friends is and now how what a big deal it was anytime they had somebody on there who was a person of color or a person who was different from that dominant culture group these are the shows that ruled the 90s so these are the shows that we looked at that were created that dominant culture group said okay this is what's normal this is what we know and so we're going to create this and and uh, this is the media that was put out there and as as a result of course we tried to emulate the people trying to emulate this so these are the norms that were established right um so there was there was a a um a, a shift away kind of from if we look at those things um that there was a shift away from uh, first of all family-based sitcoms to to things like young professionals who worked or kind of worked i think friends kind of worked a little bit uh, in some ways they had jobs i don't know but um and so we saw a shift away from family-based sitcoms that we had in the 80s for example like the cosby show and things like that growing pains family ties um those were you know family-based shows that we had in the 80s to 90s we saw um, these norms being established of um, a shift away from those things into young professionals who kind of work, right? Like friends, um, uh, a new way to think about family, that family isn't just about um, genetic ties, but family is also about, you know, the Seinfeld characters were a family, really, in a sense. For the friends cast certainly were considered a family, for example. And then we saw a change in speech that comes along with that language as a part of culture. And so we see changes in patterns of speech based on those media, right? Um, like, you know, saying something is so whatever. That was not something that happened before. That use of so as a magnifier, um, like very or really, that was not something that, that was common. So we, uh, this is so different or so whatever. You're so fancy or so whatever. That's a, that's a language change in the 90s based on media, really, that came from the media. Um, the, the heavy use of sarcasm. Uh, not that sarcasm was created in the 90s, but through the media, it really came out and was put in the forefront in the 90s. And so, and then upspeak, how we, you know, kind of had the, ended everything like a question. You know, at the end of every sentence, it, you, you kind of had to go up at the end, even if it wasn't a question, if it was a statement. You know, that was not something that really happened um, before then. Okay, so. So we saw those changes, cultural norms, where we had these, again, young professionals who move away from um, family, uh, strictly family, and uh, into different kinds of family and changes in speech then as well. As a result, we saw these things, again, these were enormously popular television shows. So created by that dominant culture, they create that media, then these cultural norms are established through these, these artifacts. Uh, and then as a result, Society seeks to normalize. Society seeks to catch up and say, "Okay, so now we need to, um, to to um, to to catch up with this. If this is what the normal is, then we need to to find that." So society um, sought to do that and and did that in a variety of ways. First of all, we saw the formula repeated in the media. Um, that became the norm in the media. Once something became popular, it became the norm. So we saw the same type of formula used in shows like Sex in the City, How I Met Your Mother. Um, we have these, again, predominantly white casts that are alternative types of families and talk in a funny way. Uh, the Big Bang Theory came along then and later as well. Um, and so we, decided, so we sought to um, repeat the success of those things and repeat that formula. I also saw things like society seeking as coffee houses were not really a popular thing before friends. I know that sounds weird, but uh, you know we went from uh, from uh, having you know these these you know bunch of old guys sitting around the uh, that's a coffee shop that's what it would have been uh, before the nineties. You know that's what we thought when we said coffee shop. It's where old guys go to share stories and and drink coffee until all hours of the day because they don't have anything else to do, right? But then after the success of that media and that society seeking to normalize, everybody wanted to drink at this fancy coffee shop and everybody wanted the fancy coffee. And, and so you, you saw these things pop up all over the place. And now not only do you have a Starbucks on every corner, but you have these really unique kind of coffee shops that, that are cool. Right. And, and they really came about as a result of that media development during the nineties.
And then we also saw society seeking to normalize like the things like the Rachel, which is what this haircut was called, the Rachel, right? After the character that Jennifer Aniston played on Friends. This haircut was such a huge deal when it first happened. Every woman wanted the Rachel. Every girl wanted the Rachel. That, that became a haircut style um, that, that society sought to emulate these people so much that, uh, that they wanted the same haircut as, as she had. Right. So it became it became known as its own thing. And all of that then fed back into this dominant culture group, of course. Right. You know, all that feeds back into, oh, this is working. So um, so we're able to establish this as a norm to the exclusion of other things and reinforce um, that those things are what is good and what is right and uh, and exclude other perspectives then and make them seem abnormal. So it creates this sort of uh, this sort of system um, that takes place when when we do these things. So okay, so we have to keep that in mind that that's that's you know the major premises of uh, of cultural analysis include a, a recognition of these things. So from a perspective uh, of today, from the contemporary perspective, we look at uh, we look at things in terms of cultural analysis. We do examine things like class, which may make you think back to our buddy Marx, right? And uh, and that was his thing. We looked at that in a previous video, and, and when we looked at Marxist analysis, and uh, that was all about class. Well, class is still important. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, so Marx kind of believed that uh, there were these uh, the different classes, the bourgeoisie, the petite bourgeoisie, and the proletariat, right? And that the proletariat was the, the largest group, the most important group, but the bourgeoisie um, kind of uh, ruled the roost and, and set the set the tone for everything. And the petite bourgeoisie were kind of in between. The middle class was sort of in between. But what we see in a contemporary sense is that in our culture, the, the um, petite bourgeoisie is the largest part of society. Okay. And we're still influenced by the bourgeoisie and the proletariat still there, the, the working people, so to speak, the working class are still there. But the petite bourgeoisie um, really uh, dominate the culture. And uh, and and so but our, and so are both creating the culture, but also uh, following in that culture. And, and as we look back at that cycle. Right. So we see um, that that. Uh, for example, uh, technology, how that influences class and and uh, and we think about that and the haves and the haves nots in terms of the digital divide and, and technology. So um, we think about things like the American dream for the class, the class uh, that, that we have created in the American dream, this idea that anybody can can reach any height. Right, that you can move between those classes. Marx would have said, "No, you can. Once you're in the proletariat, you can never get out of the proletariat." Right, but, but, uh, but, but, uh, you know, contemporarily, we would say, "No, that's not really true." That, uh, that you know, the American dream is that anybody can 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 become famous, can become wealthy, can can achieve what it is they want um, if they just work hard enough. Right, that's the idea of the American dream: is that anything is possible. And so we have to consider that as a part of our culture. This idea of a conspicuous consumption, too, that the shopping is cool. It's desirable. It's desirable to own things and, and we've become very materialistic. So we need to, to keep those things in mind, that class uh, dominates our culture. Um, also, the, the, the impact of race in our culture and, and the idea of exclusion. We, we, I mentioned this briefly as we talked about friends, the idea that, I mean, it was rarely, uh, you know, certainly weren't very many lead characters on friend none of the six were black or of a minority of any sort right um, but uh, uh but certainly even the secondary lead characters it was pretty rare to have somebody of color or have a minority represented in, in that role even so it was it was very white straight middle class um, type of of things so excluding uh, other races and representation of other other uh, races, obviously, and then stereotyping. Uh, we stereotype people in the media all the time. That's a contemporary thing that we need to consider. Um, that we stereotype people based on race and and based on um, uh, you know uh, cultures and things like that that we, we that are represented then in our media artifacts and the way that stereotype is is used to classify large groups of people uh, accurately or inaccurately. Um, this idea of assimilation is is important to us. That was that was part of the, as we discussed again in a previous video, we looked at this, but the idea of the Cosby Show was such a 
an important show culturally in some ways because it, it represented just a, you know, the, the black family could be middle class, could be professional, even upper class, right? They were professionals. They had a doctor and a lawyer as parents and, and this idea of assimilation into um, the media. Uh, but it stands out because it's so rare, right? That's, you know, um, and then media also creates this idea of othering. This idea of othering when we when we label things and we think we're doing, you know, think we're doing well on things and and uh, but we other them by the label. For example, you know, when we say a director, we we don't just say director. We say, oh, and this female director, she's she's outstanding. This outstanding female director. We don't point that out about Steven Spielberg or Martin Scorsese. We don't say, well, wow, they're really outstanding male directors. These are these are great male directors you know they do all this and they're and they're men uh, we do that with others we do you know this outstanding female director this outstanding african-american director we other people we, we label instead of just looking at wow that's a fantastic director right? they're doing a fantastic job and and uh, but we we label them and we and, and as a result we other people um, so media has that impact as well so we need to keep these things in mind um as we're as we're looking at cultural analysis so, Okay, so let's dig in real quick to some common questions and look at one artifact or one, you know, kind of thing real quickly to, to illustrate some of these um, common questions in cultural analysis. What are the dominant cultural elements under which this artifact was created? So, again, what was the culture? Remember, culture is historical. It's, it's bound to that time and that perspective. And and uh, so so we need to consider what was the dominant culture of the time that that artifact was created? How are those cultural how are those cultural ideologies represented? In that artifact, uh, how does this artifact seek to protect or challenge the dominant culture? And remember, the dominant culture is the one creating the media and, and really influencing that. So how does this artifact seek to protect that? Or is it seeking to challenge that dominant culture? And then what other cultures or ideologies um, are limited or excluded in this artifact? So real quickly, I've we've mentioned this uh, show a couple of times, but uh, but let's just take a look at the Big Bang Theory um, as, a, as an artifact here. The Big Bang Theory, very popular show. Um, so through much of the, the 2000s, and I, I can't remember exactly when it started, but uh, but it was a very popular, very, very popular show. In fact, it's spawned a spinoff now in Young Sheldon and things, but we're going to focus on the Big Bang Theory. So the common questions that we want to look at, first of all, um, what are the dominant cultural elements under which this artifact was created? Well, you know, as I mentioned, this came along in the in the wake of the post friends um, movement where um, so everybody was shifting kind of as we talked about to that um, people are professionals and you know, so they may have jobs and instead of family based and family may take on an alternative meaning. Right. And so um, and then you have those different elements, the, 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 the way that people talk and and uh, that use sarcasm and things. So uh, the do, those are the dominant cultural elements with those post friends uh, type things that we knew that everybody was you know, of the friends in Seinfeld era. This came directly after that. So you see you have this alternative family. Right. They're not genetically related, but they are a family in a sense. They act like a family. They behave like a family. They treat each other like a family. And so we see a lot of family dynamics, but not an actual family. Uh, we see that they're young professionals, um, that they are, you know, that and they're, they're, we see that uh, they're, they're really uh, um, representing the value of education and uh, predominantly, uh, you know, they're an educated group with the exception of of. Um, uh, why did her name just slip my mind? Um, Kaylee Cuoco's character. Um, shoot, what was her name? Uh, okay, it'll come to me when I'm not trying to think of it. But, you know, everybody else was educated, highly educated, right? Um, but so the dominant cultural elements but were, again, though, alternative family, but still largely heterosexual, white, um, predominantly male leads of course um so those are the, the dominant culture elements that that are in play then how are they represented in that artifact well through the show again we see that they are predominantly uh, white heterosexual and educated men professional men and women then eventually are integrated into the show um as we you know that we see uh, more and more women added but weren't there initially right they had the one woman initially and then they added some later to balance things out but all of them straight all, you know, despite the fact that the, one of the primary leads um, who played Sheldon um, was, in fact, uh, gay in, in real life. But in, in the show, everybody is straight and predominantly that's those are the main characters are 
you know, white heterosexual, uh, with the exception of Raj, you know, it's pretty white and uh, very, very little um, minority representation in the show in general. Um, so it's really reinforcing those dominant uh, cultural ideologies and norms that, that are associated with that. How does the artifact seek to protect or challenge the dominant culture? Again, the way it's cast, the way the characters are written, it really is protecting that dominant culture of, of heterosexual white men and adding in education, that, that it's okay to be educated, it's okay to be smart, that the nerds are taking over, right? That it's cool to be a nerd, it's cool to be into those kinds of things. And, and so you kind of want to slip that in a little bit too, I think, because you know, most people creating these shows are probably nerds themselves, right? What we would call nerds. They're into science fiction. They're into these types of things. So they wrote characters that are based on them and, and they were funny as well, but, uh, but trying to normalize those things and make it cool to be uh, going to a, a science fiction convention or something like that. doesn't seem so weird now that they've done, done it on the big bang theory so many times. Right. So, so they're really protecting that dominant culture with the, with this show though, really not, not challenging it too much. Um, you know, challenging that aspect of it, I guess, in terms of introducing the nerd thing, but, uh, but really protecting a lot of the different cultural aspects. And then cultures and ideologies that are limited or excluded. Well, first of all, cultures and ideologies, if we talked about race, which is not really an element of culture, but is excluded pr predominantly white cast. And, and, uh, so that is excluded, um, predominantly, um, I guess, uh, I guess I wouldn't say predominantly Christian. There were, there were several Jewish characters, but you know, religion wasn't really a part of it anyway. So, uh, but, but, uh, but excluding, um, certainly other types of religions that, that weren't represented, um, as, as strongly at all, um, you know, excluding, um, the LGBTQ community really not represented, uh, despite the fact that they had several, um, well, I mean, you know, people who were known in real life to be gay, but weren't portraying gay characters. Not that they have to be, you know, they're actors, they can portray all kinds of things, but those types of things, you really didn't see any gay characters on the show. Uh, not, not, certainly not predominantly uh, featured. And uh, uh, despite the, there was a heavy sexual component to the show, but it was all really heterosexual uh, type thing. So um, those are excluded. Um, you know, you see the exclusion of kind of uneducated people, really lower working class people. These are, these are professionals and they're focus, focusing on their lives and their issues or whatever. So, um, you see those excluded and, and just, uh, really, you know, even though Raj was there, uh, you don't really see a lot of his culture represented in that show. It, it focuses on, uh, other aspects of predominantly traditional American cultures and ideologies. So despite the fact that it's a good show, I really love that show. There are some, it is a very um, strong representation of the dominant cultural elements at that time and protecting those and, and really featuring those and limiting it or, or excluding uh, other uh, items that could be addressed. Hopefully this gives you a, an idea of what it looks like with cultural analysis when we do that. And uh, so now you can keep an eye out for those. They're really very, very important. Um, and, and we can also note them when things are going against the culture and seeking to challenge the culture. Those things become more obvious then as a result. If you have questions about cultural analysis or anything related to critical media studies, please feel free to email me. I'd love to hear from you there. In the meantime, I hope this adds again to your toolbox of uh, critical lenses for critical media studies now that you know a little bit more about cultural analysis.